What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of KFR News Radio. This is your host, Glenjamin Bonn, along with your host, Miguel. Me gusto. <laughs> that one built up a lot of anticipation for me. I uh, like, held up a lot of breath when, for that. When's he going to do it? When's he going to say it? <laughs> Went all the way around the mic just to say your all, name. Oh, ooh, mm. if only this was in surround sound. All the way around the mic who, for the mic. Who listens to podcasts in surround sound? Mm. I'm I start, would if I actually. could. Huh? <laughs> Said, I think I might actually start here pretty yeah, soon. Yeah, sounds, sounds like a, a good time. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, 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 how have you been? I'm not too bad, my man. I'm uh, watching movies and getting groovy, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. God, I, am... I feel like I'm in the 70s right now. <laughs> I am off this week. Oh. Uh, so uh, I haven't watched as many movies as you thought. I mean, I still have a good chunk of my vacation say, I left. I guarantee they're more than me. but Probably, what? but... Next week, I'll probably have a whole bunch more. Yeah. Um, but I did finally go to a movie theater. <gasps> I went to the Colonial Theater and saw Psycho yesterday. Oh, my God. How was that? It was great. I, I loved it. Have you seen it. that in theaters before? Mm, not that I can remember, but I might have. Uh, oh, I've I'm seen, sure it's a good movie. Yeah, I've seen The Shining and uh, Monty Python, Holy Grail, Doctor mm-hmm. Strange. I've seen a lot of classics in theaters. I just don't think Psycho. Yeah. Uh, and there was an old couple there who I could tell just by um, how they were talking. They thought I was too young to have seen it before. <laughs> and so I just dropped a whole bunch of Hitchcock knowledge on it, on so them. You did, so you didn't prepare for this, but I'm going to destroy you yeah. with this knowledge. Yeah, right they're, they're just like, oh, yeah, I, I don't know if you uh, if you watch a lot of older movies, but, you know, even for back then, this one, it, it was kind of a surprise. It was in black and white. I was like, mm-hmm. well, funny you should say that because the reason it's in black and white, and then I told him why it's in black and white, uh, and they were just kind of like, huh, <laughs> these darn kids, <laughs> <laughs> these darn kids and their knowledge. It reminded, me, <laughs> it reminded me when we saw mother and that woman assumed that we hadn't seen Rosemary's baby. Yeah. Uh, just cause we're youngsters. Yes. You know, how dare we? Yeah. I mean, it's only, we only live in a world where movies are more widely available than they ever have been before. It's no big deal. You know, what's driving me nuts. There was a movie just recently that I watched that I wish was more like Rosemary's baby. And I can't put my finger on it right now. Well, now I wish you, you knew. <sighs> well, when the time comes, I will tell you what it was because it was, <laughs> it could have benefited a lot from yeah. that. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, w- what have you watched this week? What What's uh, something noteworthy you want to point um, out? So, I started up a show. Uh, one of my viewers uh, a little while back recommended this to me, and I'm kind of very, very slowly getting into it. It's called Steins Gate. Uh, it's pretty much about this small group of, like, kind of teenagers um, basically inventing a time machine. Mm. Um, and... Well, uh, well, when they made it, uh, you know, some bad things start happening, like, you know, people kind of finding out. Um, and when then, will people learn that time travel is not a good idea? Yeah, it's not. And it's it kind of gets to this point later in the first season where it starts to feel like uh, Live, Die, Repeat or Edge of Tomorrow-esque. Like, he kind of keeps repeating this one scene. It gets, it gets yeah. really cool because, it, like, what happens during that. Mm-hmm. Like that time jump into like why he has the time jump is kind of like heartbreaking because he can't escape the fate of what's happening. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a really cool show. I still have to finish it. There's two seasons. First season was great. Yeah. Um, the one of the my favorite time travel stories is uh, I'm fairly certain it's the original time travel story, which is H.G. Wells mm-hmm. time machine. Uh, and because it always, it, I think no other film or book or um, TV series has done this better than that mm-hmm. uh, with, with the whole you can't escape, you know, what's inevitable and everything. Yeah. And in The Time Machine, uh, this isn't like the first 20 minutes, so it's not a huge spoiler. He um, sees something right before his wife dies. And then when he goes back trying to save her, he realizes that he's the person that he saw right before his wife dies. So he was there the entire time and couldn't stop it. So he just kind of gives up. And yeah. 
I don't think anything. Every, every a lot of things have tried to like repeat that, but nothing has done it quite as impactful yeah, as uh, as that, in my opinion. It's pretty dark, man. They they go through like the uh, butterfly effect and everything, and like everything that could happen, and, and, and it's uh, it, it's dark. Yeah, I butterfly effect. It, but... uh, Ashton Kutcher's only like truly good movie. Like the I, mean, I love that movie. So it's much. a great movie. Like a lot of his movies are fun, mm-hmm. but I would say butterfly effect is only his really his his only really good movie. Yeah. Uh, the rest are just, you know, fun, entertaining. Uh, but that one's got layers. It, it really do. Yeah. Um, after that, I started another series. Um, one of my friends lent me their, like, uh, you know how WWE now has their own, like, subscription network? Um, of course they do. Everything now, does. Because <laughs> why not capitalize on cash when they can? Um, so they have that, and he's he's really into wrestling. Yeah. And because I was talking to him about that uh, Chris Benoit thing, um, that documentary, he was like, "Oh man, you gotta you gotta watch Undertaker: The Last Ride," and it goes through his whole career and basically leading up to his retirement, and then coming out of retirement, and then going back into retirement, and all the struggles that he went through during his whole career. Really, mm-hmm. um, I'm only on episode. Well, I just finished episode two, but I mean, it's it's got potential to be a, like a really really good uh, kind of documentary series. Cool. Um, and you know, it's uh, pretty much he's like the main focus like he wanted to do this and everything like he got the people to so he's like yeah why not well let's do it let's do the last ride why not yeah um after that i watched the my plug for last week which is the old guard which was on netflix <laughs> which um, you plugged without watching it yeah i kind of regret doing that um <laughs> because there was a lot of hype for it and i kind of followed it without looking you know yeah. the things we don't do really on this site um <laughs> So I plugged that, and I was very disappointed. I was hoping it would be a lot like Extraction, mm-hmm. um, um, but it, it just wasn't. It fell flat for me. Um, I mean, that's a whole nother review. I'm just trying to do it quick. Uh, I wish it had, like, a legit kind of, like, score soundtrack instead of, like, this pop soundtrack that it had most of the time. Which, uh, after you told me this, I looked on iTunes. Apparently it does, but apparently it's not prevalent it's, enough. It's very underwhelming if it's there yeah. like i didn't really hear it had found myself paying attention to my phone more than the actual movie because it was yeah. just that it was just disappointing and then, yeah. i mean maybe eventually I, it i'll give it another try but like it it definitely does not need sequels or prequels and it i don't sounds think like it sounds like i don't like think they the premise will. there yeah oh yeah it's it's more than likely going to happen mm-hmm. but it doesn't like need them Mm-hmm. I mean, there's there's the story there on why they're going to, but like it's, I don't think it was good enough to continue. Yeah, I mean, I like Charlize there, and I like her career and what she's been doing like the last ten years. But uh, I feel I don't know. like other than Mad Max Fury Road, a lot of the action movies she does have great action sequences, but not much plot. Yeah, uh, like Atomic Blonde, beautiful action sequences, mm-hmm. but the plot was very lacking. Um, I'm sure there's more. Eon Flux, I believe she's in, which from yeah, what I, I hear so is, is visually stunning, but the story again. I mean, the action, the action sequences were cool, but like it just, uh, it kind of didn't, you know, yeah, pull through. Um, yeah. And this, this whole time watching this movie, I'm like, she would be crazy in John Wick. Oh, like, yeah. Like, if you replaced her with Ruby Rose, no offense to Ruby Rose, but like, and just kind of cut out that whole like deaf thing and sign language, I think. Mm hmm. I think this would she would have been killer for that. I think movie. she would have been killer even if she if she was mute and and uh, yeah. didn't and and use sign language. Uh, I mean, she just would have been better overall than Ruby Rose. Yeah. Again, I don't blame Ruby Rose for that. I blame no the direction of that character, um, and a little bit of Ruby Rose. But you know, she, I yeah. feel like it's, she was. It's it's not a major thing against her. It's, yeah, yeah. Like I mean, she's she's good in Orange Is the New Black. Uh, she the, also followed up against a really good original movie oh yeah she she, there was no way no way she was gonna be any of the the main villains in Mm -hmm. in the first one so it it was really unfair for her (laughs) yeah um i mean besides that that's kind of all i watched other than the movie we're going to review uh, yeah now but uh what did you watch my friend uh so other than we are columbine which we'll get to in a few minutes here uh, I watched a movie recommended by our good friend John Clark mm-hmm. uh, because the sequel is coming out soon, which is just a cheap slasher horror movie called Terrifier, which kind oh. of broke Netflix a few years back when it came out. Um, 
because everyone knows that horror fans are rabid and, uh, you know, that's I mean that's all you really need everything. to describe it. They're overhype. They overhype everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which I mean, like if you're if this is your kind of movie, it's probably not going to be overhyped for you. Yeah. But a lot of the things that horror fans I think forget is that slasher, bloody gore horror movies that don't really have much of a plot are very niche and not everyone you know likes things that are just flashy with blood and everything true um like we described in the last podcast yeah exactly so i think this i did not like this movie at all i thought it was awful Mm -hmm. um but it's also not made for me so i i I get why people do like it it's just not my kind of movie the guy who played the clown murderer guy he was great um literally every other actor uh looked like they you know grabbed them from the high school musical that was greatly miscast because <laughs> the the choir teacher's daughter was cast in the lead when she's not good at all um so that was very specific and i don't know why I say that. you went into detail about that <laughs> um, no, i wish i was the choir's daughter i want to be hired for a movie <laughs> But yeah, it, it just was it wasn't good, but there's you know, this has its fan base. If you're into cheap slasher schlock, you're going to love this movie. I just didn't like it at all. Mm-hmm. Um but again, not my kind of thing. Um and I'm okay with that. I I'm glad I watched it just cuz I do like watching bad movies. Uh in my opinion, bad movies just to, you know, solidify what I do like. Yeah. Um then it I really, moved on. really helps boost your other things. Yeah, then, then I moved on to the spiritual prequel of Terrifier, which is John Wayne's The Searchers. Um, that, of course, was a joke. There's nothing even remotely <laughs> close. Say, I don't really think there's anything there. <laughs> there wasn't. That was just a really bad joke. Um, this movie had beautiful cinematography, uh, a problematic plot, <laughs> and, and overall was just boring. Um, so like, you know, true grit, I think is a better Western than the searchers for some reason, the searchers gets all the praise. It's on like the AFI top 100 list, uh, of American films. Mm -hmm. I don't see it. Um, other than maybe this, the grand scale of everything. Uh, do you think everything is just like there because of John Wayne? really too well i I listened to this podcast called unspooled um and they actually just wrapped up afi's top 100 Mm -hmm. uh and and um the their whole thing was that you could tell that the people who chose afi's top 100 really like picked their friends like scorsese has like six or seven movies on there yeah uh there's a whole bunch of westerns whole bunch of vietnam movies so you could you could see the kind of people that were picking it, and it's not a good representation of American film in general. Mm-hmm. That's not to say no John Wayne movie should be on there. Yeah, uh, I I personally like True Grit, the original, mm-hmm. is a fantastic film. It is, um, and which we we did earlier on the podcast a couple years ago, I think. Uh, and and uh, but the search is just it fell flat. It's I could see it even being problematic for back in the day. Um, you know they're very abusive to every single native american in this movie not even mm. not even like not not one redeeming character when it comes to the treatment of native americans mm-hmm. um which is i don't know if that was done on purpose john ford i know uh relatively usually has like a a relatively good conscience when he's making these kinds of movies um at least from what i hear i'm not too familiar with his work uh but you could just f- feel the hatred of Native Americans. And maybe that was on purpose. I think it fell flat. Yeah, I feel like it, I feel like it would be, but I mean, maybe at that time, I don't know. I yeah, don't know. It, it's just, it's hard to read because, you know, I wouldn't hold it past them if they, if that's just how they viewed Native Americans at that time. Yeah. Uh, especially with things John Wayne has said about Native Americans. Uh, not that I think he hated them as much as people say he does, but he's very unempathetic with how they feel about how they were treated. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just overall a problematic film. I I do think people should watch problematic films, knowing that they're problematic, just you know to get a reference point. Yeah. Um, you know if you don't want to, that's fine. But I do I do think there is benefit in that. So it's not just like oh I heard this movie's problematic, I'm not going to see it. And then someone says, well have you seen it? And you're like no. Then all of your arguments are invalid at that point. Yeah. Um, for real. But yeah, it's you can pass it. Uh, it's got great cinematography. That's really the only redeeming part of it. 
the rest of it I could take or leave. Um, then I watched a movie which I technically had seen when I was 14, uh, but was definitely not old enough to appreciate it back then. It's a uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman starred film called Love Liza. Uh, it's about this man whose wife had killed herself and it's just him grieving and he becomes like a, uh, addicted to huffing gasoline as you do, as you do. Um, and it's, it's, it's definitely something that you appreciate more when you're older. Uh, cause I, I definitely, I don't remember much of it from when I was 14, but it, it's, it's a solid movie. You know, it's, it's, uh, funny when it needs to be. It's sad when it needs to be. It's got great performances as usual from Sil- Philip Seymour Hoffman and Kathy Bates. Um, I'm but, definitely doing myself and a lot of us a disservice not seeing a lot of his films. Oh, he's great. He he. I, um, until his passing, he was my favorite living actor. Yeah. Uh, now that is Michael Shannon's honor, <laughs> I guess <laughs> you could call it. Um, but yeah, I love Philip Seymour Hoffman. I, I haven't seen nearly as much of his stuff as I would as I would like to, but he's he's. He yeah, he's he's really talent. an astounding actor. I just yeah. uh, just haven't seen much of what he has done. Oh yeah, I, I'll, I'll give you a list of movies you should watch of his, just to kind of get a sense of his. Yeah. His uh his Sounds talent. Sounds good to me. Um, and then the last one I just finished is an A twenty four movie because I've been jonesing for a new A twenty four movie, <laughs> uh, and with theaters being shut down, it's been kind of impossible to see their newer stuff. Yeah, I remember um, seeing the poster for this one in theaters. I know what this one already is, so it's kind of funny. Because I posted it, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, it's, it's hilarious. Yeah, First Cal, directed by Kelly Reichardt. Um, it's kind of like an American Dream type story where it's uh, these two men who kind of meet each other on the Oregon Trail. Um, they start like this this bakery business, and it's not started in the most honest of ways Mm -hmm. um and it kind of just goes through their journey and shows how even when america the american dream was at its height it was still a very unfair lie in a way yeah than what was sold to a lot of immigrants um so yeah I, i it's it's a good movie it's it's very understated it's not gonna it's not flashy at all uh, but it's a solid film, you know, a 24, it's your typical a 24, uh, movie that, that doesn't become one of their big earners, yeah. um, where it's very understated. It's just a great character study. And I mean, alone with the poster, it kind of sells you on what it is. It's oh yeah. A, the poster is a cow is just on a, a raft, a cow on a raft. And that's, that's, I haven't, that's I haven't it. seen a single poster after that one. Just, mm-hmm. just that. I'm pretty sure that's the only poster. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty that's, sure that's the only it's, one. It's kind of hilarious regardless. But yeah, it's it's a solid movie. I do suggest it. Um, but yeah, that's all I watched this week other than We Are Columbine. Again, okay. just a few more minutes until we get to that. Uh, we got some news. Uh, should we have your slightly depressing news first and then end with mine, which is... Yeah. Um, which is skeptical, weirdly enough, but... all of mine is kind of sad and scary at two points there's i got two articles um, okay regis philbin has passed away uh, we all know him as the legendary tv host uh he died at what i believe was like 84 or i think it's at 88 yeah 89 actually there it 89. is 89 okay. um oh no you're right 80 one month shy of his 89th birthday so Ooh. i mean legend man right yeah. there regis who wants philbin. to be a millionaire regis mm-hmm. and kelly i believe he hosted a few new year's eve shows yeah um yeah, great, great, uh, great personality. I don't know him personally, obviously, so I can't say if he's a great person, but he seemed like a great dude. Yeah, he always <laughs> seemed like a genuinely humble guy whenever he was on anything. Um, sadly, someone else died. Um, she was 104 years old. She was an actress from Gone with the Wind. Mm-hmm. Um, Olivia de Havilland. 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 I'm sorry. That, I don't know. But, uh, both of them, regardless, have lived long lives. Yeah. So it's uh, it's it's really nice that they got to do that um, and got to have the careers that they had. Um, but there, sadly, there we go. We've got yeah. those two celebrity deaths. Um, and then moving on, uh, we've got Netflix just bought the rights to Reddit No Sleep Horror Story, which, uh, which was called My Wife and I Bought a Ranch, um, which I honestly, I haven't read the actual story but i've i read a lot of the no sleep horror stories often yeah and there's a lot of good stories in there 
Yeah. And I really hope they continue to do something like this, especially with the horror, because that's something that needs really good stories. Yeah. Specifically. I feel like we uh, horror has gone into a, a, a massive repeating of, yeah. of all of the stories they've ever done. Definitely um, a lot of copy and paste. Yeah. Uh, and a lot without, of that is I just because horror too. is so cheap to do. Yeah. Um, and and do it well. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of copy and paste. And, and uh, hopefully they do something slightly different with these stories. Mm-hmm. But who knows? Um, is that it for your news? Uh, that That is it. I'm just really looking forward to that horror story now. Oh, I'm going to yeah. read it after this. Yeah. Uh, I My news is skeptically positive. Um, cause you know, we, things keep getting pushed back. Uh, last week we talked about how both Tenet and Mulan were pushed back with no rescheduled dates, which up until that point they had rescheduled, uh, they had announced the new date at when they said they were rescheduling it. Uh, last time they pushed it back, they said they were pushing it back indefinitely, which made me think it would be a long time. Um, but Tenet has announced that it is going to be coming out September 3rd. Again, assuming it doesn't get pushed back again, I'm skeptically optimistic about it. And because of this announcement, uh, AMC said that they will be opening on August 12th when they said they were going to, they didn't change the plans even after Tenet moved, which for them, since they're on the verge of going bankrupt, I think is smart. Um, and then Regal announced that they are opening, uh, their doors are starting to opening some of their doors on August 21st. So hopefully those dates actually come to fruition and we don't have to have the days pushed back again. Yeah, I've I've gotten a couple emails. Um, one of them saying uh, we may open as early. No hope as the 14th. But as I have been sitting here for absolute months, I'm going to keep holding on to this chair. Um, yeah, until until the day you walk in and clock in. Yeah. Um, um, cause I, I don't think they'll do since that. America is the way it be. Um, yeah. I'm going to just keep sitting here. <laughs> well, luckily our, uh, commander in orange, uh, has finally started to seemingly take it seriously. I still don't fully believe that he does. Yeah. Uh, and it's months way too late, but you know, the fact that we have to celebrate him actually putting on a fucking mask is embarrassing. Absolutely. Um, so um so yeah anyway yeah. um and crossing our fingers until the day we can get back in there and watch tenant please yeah. god take my soul i want to see that movie oh same here and if, if you guys have uh if anyone listening has smaller art house theaters near them that are open but showing older movies go check those out support those theaters because they don't have the massive corporate bucks that are, yeah. are that are behind regal and amc uh, a lot of them luckily are historical landmarks so they do have some government support Mm -hmm. but these um these classics that they're showing when i went to go see it it would have been eight dollars if i didn't have a membership it was only five dollars because it did so it is cheaper than a normal ticket movie uh ticket price and uh you know you get the experience of watching a a movie in a theater even if it's a movie you've already seen before yeah and uh you support it's a whole different experience going to the theater you support smaller theaters which in my opinion are the better theaters because they're not trying to cater to people that don't care about movies. And their like, popcorn is delicious. The popcorn is always delicious. Ooh, excuse me. You okay, buddy? I was just thinking about how delicious their popcorn is. Oh, God. Bryn Mawr Film Institute. Let me tell you about their that popcorn. That place always be good. Oh, we, we got to go there again once it opens up. But 100%. They use sunflower seed oil to pop their popcorn. Mm-hmm. And Can Regal say that? No. Can AMC see that? I don't know because I didn't work there, but I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, their their popcorn's delicious at Bryn Mawr. Um so yeah, support your local small independent theaters and uh you know keep them keep them open. Yes, sir. Yeah. Wear a mask. Come on. <laughs> so wear a mask. But yeah, so with all that being said, we got some good news. Support your local theater. Uh now we're gonna kind of I guess bring it down a little bit. Yeah, we're going to do a sad jump over to the movies. Sad jump over. uh, We're going to talk about We Are Columbine. Having a friend present it in an honest, genuine way is the only way that I would agree to do something like this. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. This is being called one of the worst school shootings in our nation. We learned to live together because we were all under the same microscope. You were forced to grow up far too quickly, and you were denied a normal high school life. 
We are Columbine. Nearly 20 years after one of the deadliest school shootings in U.S. history, four survivors returned to Columbine High School to share their experiences and journeys towards healing. Fuck yeah, dude! See, sorry. I didn't, I didn't want, I didn't want to make it a big deal because it's yeah. a big. <laughs> I'm sorry. I w I'm very happy for you. This is. Uh, I'm hyperventilating not, right now. I'm so this, happy. <laughs> this is not me celebrating. Obviously, this tragic story. This is. This I is... finally read a synopsis without doing the stutter step. <laughs> and I feel bad that I had an outburst, but I'm just so happy for you. Um. So yeah, that that's the synopsis. <laughs> um. Directed by Lara Farber, starring Gustavo, the, uh, Jesus Christ, the Arthene. The Arthene, uh, Zach Martin, Jamie Norton, Amy Stanley, and Kiki Leba. 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 Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, it's it's about these these four people, man, who went through the struggles of what they had to go through twenty years ago. Yeah. Um, that's rough, man. Uh, one thing I loved about this documentary, uh, if there's anything to love, just because you know the the tragedy of it, is um, that it was made by a student who yeah. was there at during the the shooting um and it's kind of summed up perfectly i believe it is amy that is uh being interviewed in the very first where she says i wouldn't have done this if if it, you weren't you yeah i think you it, i think it was amy yeah and she she says that i i, I she says to laura the director I know uh, you'll you'll tell our story correctly and not exploit it because mm -hmm. you were you were there with us. So that is the biggest takeaway from this documentary is that it is made by and for the people who are directly affected because they were there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was really the beautiful part of it. If there is anything beautiful in it, it's that you see them kind of taking back their story. Because, like I said last week, I've seen a lot of documentaries. Uh, a lot of them focus around the shooters. Um, yeah, and this one, it's it's nice that it doesn't even really touch that at all. Other than, yeah. obviously, that it happened, but they don't the, I, say names or anything. Yeah, the, the most they say is that it's students with guns. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I'm going to try to avoid saying their names just out of respect for the yeah. the, the students in this film. Um, but I've seen a lot uh, that are about those two students in particular and also their parents uh which i do think is a an important story to tell is a mm -hmm. lot of people forget the parents of the shooter uh you know are kind of also victims not directly but you know from the aftermath of everything yeah. um and but i i loved how this focused only on them it didn't talk about why it happened it just talked about their experiences uh no massive opinions other than what was going through their head that day mm -hmm. we're told there was no major leaps it was a very you know toned back film about this and i could see that getting a lot of backlash from you know um more ignorant audience members were like oh they didn't talk about the shooting at all was like, yeah um, they talked about a different aspect of the shooting this, this was about the kids this yeah. was about the teachers this was about the people that were involved not naming the people who caused the incident mm -hmm. um and just seeing how they all came out and it, it was actually it was really touching um because i let up like our our area um like uh, everybody really expected school shootings to happen. Let's let's be honest. And the whole time, like I'm sitting there, I'm like this 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 could have been me at any moment. Not not like to take away from them, yeah. but like it's it's pretty nuts, man. And to like try to like envision like what they were going through and what could have happened and all that. It's 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 crazy. Yeah, um, yeah. We we the thing that a lot of older people don't understand, like everyone our age is. I don't want to say completely anti-gun, but they have a much more aggressive standpoint to, you know, um, logical background checks mm -hmm. and and logical practices to making sure potentially dangerous people don't get weapons. And I understand the gray area that that creates regarding the Second Amendment. But, you know, what a lot of people who in older generations don't understand is we people our age have literally gone to school every single day since 1999, if not before that from the earlier 
uh, shootings that were not near, not as as popular or infamous, uh, not popular, yeah. um, as as this one. Since this day, this like while it might not have been in the forefront of our mind, in the back of our mind, it was always it could happen. Everyone in every school also always had that one person that was said, "Oh, if it's this person, I would understand." Mm-hmm. Um, or you know, I wouldn't be surprised. Not understand. I wouldn't be surprised if this person was the person to do it at our school. Yeah. And it's because of how the media portrayed this. You know, I, I talked about last week how I was in third grade. They turned on the news and they showed a kid bloodied, hanging out of a window, being rescued. Um, you know, I, up until. A few years ago, I'd assumed that that kid was dead. I I found out a few years ago that he lived and is still alive. Um, but you, it's it's even though we weren't directly affected by this, and uh, this is kind of touched on by the the English teacher uh, whose name's escaping me, but he's he's interviewed a lot in this. Um, I want to say it's maybe Frank Frank DeAngelis. I think is the teacher's name. Um. He, he talks about how everyone says, oh, you weren't in the library, so it must not have been that bad. It's like, no, you're still affected by it. Yeah. And while people our age weren't nearly as affected by it, by, uh, you know, as the students of Columbine, there's still that thing in the back of our head, like, this could be the last day. There's a POD song about it, for God's sakes. Yeah. <laughs> Youth of the Nation. Last day of the rest of my life. I wish I would have known because I, I would have kissed my mother goodbye. Like it's <laughs> that that is the entire mindset of our, our generation, unfortunately. Yeah, it's um, like just going whether or not you were in the library, if you were just locked in a class, like they there was a instance where one of them and I, I think it was Gus um, talked about how like they were just sitting there and then a teacher unlocks the door and runs in with no shirt on blood covered all over him. Like that's crazy. And and doesn't even like respond to them. Yeah, He's only in there for like less than a minute to grab something and runs back out. Mm -hmm. That's, that's insane. Yeah. Like just imagine going through that, like just, and then like the negligence of people like just saying, Oh, you, you couldn't have been that bad. Like, yeah, you were in a room. No, that's just messed up. Shut up. Yeah. I think one of the people interviewed like, got out like was was in a part of the the school that got out like right away Mm -hmm. didn't see the gunman at all only heard the gunshots and he 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 was still obviously very affected by it just because it's it's when something so dark and and for lack of a better word sinister happens so close to you it doesn't matter how close you were to death you're still you know people who know people or you knew of people who were directly affected. Yeah. Uh, you, you still think, oh, it could happen again, only this time I won't be so lucky. There, there's a trauma that is goes on behind it, and I, I loved how this documentary focused on that. It focused on everyone's trauma, no matter how serious or seemingly to outside sources inconsequential. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I, I believe it was Amy, the same woman we were talking about before, who was at a table in the cafeteria where they first attacked and under her table was a, one of the bombs that didn't go off. Yeah. You're that close to dying. If they just made that bomb correctly, it's a whole other story. Um, Yeah. And then you had Jamie who didn't even know where her sister was and she thought was dead the whole time. So she was falling her eyes. It's, it's a lot, man. That's, um, like I wish that I had researched more on, like or watched another documentary before this one about everything because I, st- I still don't know a lot about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was hoping to go into this one to learn about it, but I'm glad because we have to learn about the the people involved or like the people that were victims. Mm-hmm. Um, and like that was that was a really nice thing to go into, so I can go into that and being like, oh my god. Yeah. There, there's it's I I definitely lo- liked how this put faces to the school you know mm-hmm. the the uh, a great the, another thing i loved about this it, it felt like they were trying to take the name of their school back because yeah columbine is now synonymous with tragedy and um you know that people i remember people being surprised that they didn't change the school name 
when when they went back to school and, they, mm-hmm. and like why should they just because something bad happened there yeah. it's it's this mindset that not just this country the entire world has where people just want to change things to forget what happened and that's one way to cope but that it, doesn't change that it still happened it there. doesn't change that it still happened and it and keeping the the name also lets you keep a certain sense of control mm-hmm. um, where you're like, you, you know, this does not define us. This is something that happened, but it does not define yeah. who we are. And that was one thread throughout. You know, it started talking about the pep rally and it ended with a pep rally. And I thought that was a really beautiful symbolism that, um, you know, kind of showed where all the students' mindset was, where they were just trying to take back control of their town and and the whole thing behind this is how the media reacted to it you know yeah uh even though a lot of people think fake news is a joke and i i think a lot of people think there's more fake news than there actually is everyone would agree with that the media definitely jumps to conclusions way too quickly of course. Um, and no one disagrees with that. It's it's when you question facts that it becomes a problem. But, like, it, the, the way this was covered was very, like, tabloidish, where they're talking about, like, gangs of people in trench coats just because the two shooters wore trench coats. Yeah, and, and that, the, that the principal beat kids up or something like yeah, that. Yeah, the principal too. beat kids up, the jocks beat kids up. And while you will if, – if you watch another documentary – uh, on this, you will probably see that yes, a few jocks did people up, did mm-hmm. beat people up, but that is literally no different than any other school. Then, in yeah, than everywhere. Yeah, it, it, and people people butt heads when you put them in close quarters. When you put a lot of people in close quarters, they butt heads, and when you're that young, you don't know how to use your words to get through. Not that they're, they're like in, incredibly young, but like yeah, you know violence speaks faster than words <laughs> it's true. and it's not the best way to do it but that's the way your mind works when you're a kid yeah you, you're like oh i don't have time to talk this out i just gotta beat his ass or whatever um it's uh, sorry i've been kind of rambling about no this. you're fine <laughs> is this this is this event even though i'm like two thousand miles away deeply affected my life mm-hmm. and my mindset and and it's as as it's as important to me to see this film as it can be for someone as distance from it as I am, you know, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, it's I mean, it's it's a huge meme for America to be like what happens with school shootings and stuff. But like yeah. this, this it's it's terrifying to know as like being here that it could happen at any time, mm-hmm. even if it is air quotes a meme. Um it's it's still kind of haunting and this this tells a really good story of like the you know the actions of that yeah and how it how it turns out it's haunting yeah and it's it's kind of frustrating reading some of the negative reviews of here um because it, it completely misses the point like this one i'm reading right now says i failed to see the point of this documentary no one featured in this film were injured and did not know where uh, the shooters or the victims that's not the fucking point of this documentary the point of this documentary yeah. is to show that trauma happens no matter how close you are to it um mm-hmm. and i feel like that rings extremely true um and it really bothers me that this person really just wanted to see the blood and guts of it in, yeah. in, in a way it's it's kind of this movie is the antithesis of what Americans want in in stories like this which is mm-hmm. the reason the news is so bad and and quick to make uh you know new stories out of nothing um not that this is a nothing new story but they tried to jump to conclusions with it yeah um and and, and this guy's mindset is just completely where what is wrong with America in my opinion it's 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 dumb and ignorant yeah i think uh Hey, that that is dumb and ignorant. That's really stupid. Um, yeah. And then it just got me thinking. You know who the unsung heroes of this movies are, or movie? Jesus, this documentary, like this whole event that happened. Hmm. Teachers, man. Oh yeah. Teachers are amazing, and the fact that teachers were even like a part of this documentary was was awesome. Oh yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, 
especially that uh, segment where the one teacher was talking about how he was affected and he would try to save face, you know, with with students. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as they left, he would just like cry and and panic behind his desk. Uh, It's it's spoke volumes to me about it's, like the unseen sacrifice of teachers teachers just don't get enough credit and it, it drives yeah. me nuts yeah. definitely the backbone of your children's whole life and uh, this this also shows that it's like all these kids were affected be, like of because of the actions that these teachers took and like held up yeah. for them to keep moving forward and stuff it, it was awesome yeah absolutely um yeah i don't really have too much to say left uh yeah it's really more of a uh, an emotional study than it is like a, a film study in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, to reiterate, I love that it talked more about like the trauma of people that, you know, in the sense of a news story, weren't that affected, even though they were, obviously. It, I, I just liked how it went about it. It went about it in a very delicate and respectful way. And a lot of it has to do because Laura Farber, who directed it, was there that day as a student mm-hmm. um and it's more powerful than i think people give it credit yeah i think unlike that review that you read um i think i was going into it thinking that i was going to learn more about it instead i learned about the people and which was a really nice kind of turnaround mm-hmm. um so now i can go into whenever i do watch another documentary about what happened i yeah. can go into it feeling more emotion and like feeling more respect for the people who were in it instead yeah. of just being like, Oh, I'm just watching people die right now, which is mm. sad. Obviously. Yeah. You got anything else to point out? Uh, or say? I, I, I think that's uh, it for me. All right. So that brings us to the judgment. Glenn, it is your pick. So that means you pick whether or not this is a shelf, a shelf movie. I don't want to make jokes about it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I, th- I think, I think we spoke enough about it to say that I think it would obviously be a shelf boy. Um, personally uh it it's very impactful um some of the reviews are kind of really just disrespectful in ways um i could see where they're coming from they wanted to they wanted to like see stuff but this was a movie about the people and not about the event like specifically and what how many people died or anything like that this is about the people exactly and and you can tell just from the poster that it's a different columbine documentary Mm -hmm. all of the other columbine documentaries show like news clips of the the perpetrators it, sh- it shows uh like the school in like a gray scale filter and and makes it look like a horror movie this one this poster is is bright and, and blue and beautiful and it's got mm-hmm. silhouettes of people holding hands or shadows of people holding hands so if you don't get that this is a di- different com- uh columbine documentary from that you're ignorant like it's yeah it's obviously I, I understand people's fascination with this. I, for one, for lack of a better word, am fascinated with it. But this is a different and much needed depiction of what happened. Yeah. Um. And, and I also agree that it should be a, a shelf boy. Um. So with that being said, We Are Columbine goes on the shelf with many other films. Uh, no. we, we did it. Yeah, we did it. We got through. Um. If you're still with us, I appreciate you, even though this isn't our, our normal silly selves. Uh, it's, you know, it's, we we can't be our silly selves all the yeah, time. Yeah, that'd, that'd be disrespectful. Yeah, exactly. So that brings us to plugs. Glenn, what is your plug for the week? Um, so I found this a while ago. Uh, we all know, as far as, because I keep bragging about it, but we all know that I'm on Twitch and about a month or so ago, I found somebody on there who I literally blew my mind. I was like, what? <laughs> um, so we all know Linkin Park, correct? Mm-hmm. We know Mike Shinoda, mm-hmm. the man, mm-hmm. the legend. Mm-hmm. And it turns out my man is on Twitch. Oh. Sometimes he plays Animal Crossing, which I know you'll get a kick out of. <laughs> Sometimes, or all the time, he makes music. Uh, and he just puts them on YouTube, like just like he does like a weekly challenge or daily challenge where he tries mm-hmm. to make a song that the uh, that the viewers like want him to make, and like he'll That's awesome. he'll sit down and make it, and he makes obviously bangers. Bang- they're oh, yeah, they're yeah. all amazing. And you, he, even if you don't watch it for him making music, he's such like a humble dude. He'll sit there and talk to you about everything. It's it's oh, great. Yeah. 
I didn't really have a trailer for anything, so this is one of those songs that I made on stream. This is Mike Shinoda. Here he is. That's that's pretty great. I, I love it when celebrities do that. I don't think he has a Twitch uh, channel or, or streaming account, but uh, the most hilariously wholesome thing I've ever seen regarding a video game is that badass Danny Trejo <laughs> plays Animal Crossing. And That's he, actually hilarious. <laughs> yeah, he, he was, uh, there's this one YouTube channel that is dedicated to going to uh, famous people, whether or not they be influencers or uh, actors, mm -hmm. um, musicians. It's dedicated to visiting their islands and kind of having them. It's like cribs, but with Animal Crossing. Yeah. Um, and Danny Trejo is on there. <laughs> And it's the most wholesome thing. That's not my my plug. I just wanted yeah, to, just to bring thought that you'd up. segue it to it. Yeah, because it's it's adorable and hilarious because he is Danny Trejo, and uh, I don't know if he's killed people, but I wouldn't be surprised if he has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in every every right of the way. Um, yeah. and so that's official Mike Shinoda on Twitch. Official Mike Shinoda on Twitch. Um, my pitch for this week, I, if you remember a few weeks back, I watched that Will Ferrell movie, Eurovision Song Contest. Mm -hmm. um, it had a longer title. I forget the full title. It was about a, a, a band from Iceland going to Eurovision Song Contest uh, to try to win. Uh, well, my pitch is the official 2020 submission for the Eurovision con uh, Song Contest from Iceland. Oh. Um, it is... Uh, the band is and it is it's an Icelandic band, so I'm gonna butcher this. Just full disclosure, Dathi and Gagnamagnith, or something. No, that sounded perfect, to be honest. It, <laughs> uh, it's probably not, but uh, it's 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 close. Um, <laughs> because it's spelled with Icelandic letters that we don't have on our keyboard. Uh, if you type in Dadi, which is D A D I. Uh, Freyr, F R E Y R, you'll be able to find this. Uh, it is called Think About Things. Um, my pitch is the song in general, but there is a music video which is hilarious for it, and then you can also see their live uh performance of it on Eurovision Song Contest. Um, okay. but it is called Think About Things from Dathi and Gagna Magnith. Hey, that one was actually pretty good, I, I was think. Gonna say, that one kind of hit home, Gagna right Magnith. There. <laughs> Uh, but it's a great song. I, I highly suggest it. It's, it's a bop. It's a slap. It slaps. It's, it's, it's a, two two little music things. Nice, dude. Yeah. Look yeah. at us. So those are our plugs for for this week. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. I think I, you know, did as best as I could that second time. So we're going to move on to our assignment for next week. This week it is going to be Netflix Roulette. For everyone who is unaware, the rules are we spin the Netflix roulette wheel three times and we pick between the three movies that they have. And uh, we have to we have to pick one of the three unless one of the selections is a 2020 show uh, film. Yeah. Then we can spin again. But as long as they're at least from last year or earlier, we can pick, we have to pick one of the three. So without any further ado, here comes the first spin. A chicka 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 chicka. It is called My Masterpiece. Uh, Argentina? Argentina film? Yeah. Looks like Argentina. Mia, mia bra mm. maestra. Yep. Uh, it is written by Andre Duprat and Gaston Duprat, directed by Gaston Duprat, uh, starring Andrea Acado, Lucas Arando, Raul Arrivalo, and Ma... Ma Mahmoud Azim. So my masterpiece is about Arturo, who is an unscrupulous art dealer, and Renzo, his socially awkward painter and longtime friend, willing to risk it all. They develop develop an extreme and ludicrous plan to save themselves. Um, Seven point one on IMDb, uh, no Metacritic score. Um, doesn't but, sound bad though. Yeah, it doesn't sound bad. That's a potential. Uh, spin number two. What is happening? Stop it. Stand and deliver. Oh. 
from 1988. It's actually funny. I was going to watch this a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, it is written by Ramon Menendez and Tom Muska, directed by Ramon uh, Ramon Menendez. Oh Menendez. Had starring Edward James Olmos, uh, Estelle Harris, Mark Fallon, or Fallon. And there's someone else in here I'm trying to find. Lou Diamond Phillips. Um, and Stand and Deliver is... The story of Jamie Escalante, a high school teacher who successfully inspired his dropout prone students to learn calculus. Uh, I have seen this movie, but I was in sixth grade when I saw it. So I don't remember much of it, but I remember it being really good. I really don't want that to go into the fact like me having technically seen it. Yeah, I don't want to factor into our decision. Um, Especially since you were such a young lad. I was such a young lad. Such a young lad. So that's spin number two. Spin number three. <laughs> Zokoman 2011. I believe this is from India. Zokoman. Let's see. What is this? Oh, interesting. Yes, looks like it's Look from India. Look at them India. reviews. <clears throat> yeah. It is written by Javed Akhtar, Satajit Bakht, uh, Batkal, Svati Chakravarti Bakhtal, Lancy Fernandez, and Devi Nidhi Sharma. I apologize to anyone that speaks Hindi that I just butchered those names. And is directed by Satyayit Bhatkal. Uh, it's about an orphan who is abused and abandoned, believed to be dead, and upon his return is first featured as a ghost and then projected as a superhero. Or feared as a ghost, if you really want to. <laughs> oh, yeah. First feared as a ghost and then projected as a superhero. My bad. Um, Imagine being featured as a ghost. Hey, featured everybody. as a ghost in, in a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that one has a 4.1. Uh, What's I'm actually not... really funny about that, that's a Disney film. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Just, uh, just the trailer was kind of playing itself, and uh, it popped up. Disney. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that are our three choices. My masterpiece, Stand and Deliver, Zokoman. Uh, um, full disclosure, I am leaning Stand and Deliver. I, I was going to say either Stand and Deliver. I think it's Stand and Deliver, Masterpiece, and then Zokoman. Is your the order you want to watch it? Yeah. Okay, Stand and Deliver is definitely still on Netflix. Um, hopefully it doesn't change over <laughs> mm. with the 1st of August coming up. Yeah. Uh, if so, we'll just add it because you can definitely rent it. Uh, I'm cool with Stand and Deliver if you are. Yeah, that's fine with me. Okay, so Stand and Deliver is our assignment for next week. Uh, I've already discussed the plot. I'm pretty excited. I'm I, I'm excited to rewatch it since it was a movie I was probably definitely too young to appreciate yeah. uh, when I watched it when I was 12. Um, so that is Stand and Deliver on Netflix. Stay awake as you're waking up. Wake up this morning, how are you? Bring toothpicks. You pinch open your eyes. Can we talk about sex? If we discuss sex, I have to give sexual homework. I wouldn't do that if I was you. I'd lose a finger, I won't be able to count to ten. At a tough school, someone had to take a stand, and someone did. Now the critics stand up and cheer for Stand and Deliver. There we go. And that will do it until next week. Thank you, everyone, for listening. As always, you can follow our website, www.keystonefilmreview.com. On Instagram, we are Keystone underscore film underscore review. Twitter, Keystone underscore film. On Facebook, Keystone Film Review. And on Letterboxd, I am Mike KFR. And I am Glenn KFR. And that will do it until we watch Stand and Deliver. Insert Cartman saying, how do I reach these keys? How do I reach these keys? <laughs> Which is very... The movie's better than that. So. Oh, that was happening downstairs. Do you hear that? I do hear that. Glenn's being invaded by everybody. Help!